Father in heaven, this day, this morning, just right now, we, we seek to answer one of the greatest perplexities in life. Why do we experience suffering? Why, why do bad things happen to good people? Lord, where are you in the midst of these things? Why don't you do something about it? Why didn't you do something about it? Why won't you do something? So just now, Lord, as we seek to answer the, one of the greatest questions in life, we ask for your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit to guide us in our understanding of your word. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wherever you go in the world, suffering has not one place it has not touched. Everywhere you go in the world, there is suffering. Whether it is earthquakes or natural disasters, suffering takes place everywhere. It is a universal aspect that connects each one of us. So there's two things you can be sure of in life. One, you're going to grow old. Or two, you're going to die. Sounds very sober. Pastor, can't you be more positive? I'm positive you're going to die. Okay. Positive it's going to happen. But in the process from birth to death, why is there suffering? Why do natural disasters take place at an unprecedented rate? Why is it that when war and terrorism wreaks our world, wrecks our world, why is it that the innocent seem to suffer the most? Why do we have refugees who have to flee their countries, their homes, their, their homeland? Why does suffering take place? It's one of the greatest questions that we are seeking to answer. Why does God allow suffering? Why is it in our own experience, maybe you've come this week, maybe you've experienced some great tragedy. Somebody passed away, somebody who didn't deserve, some, some drunk driver driving through Tucson hit somebody. Why is there suffering in South Tucson? Why is there suffering in our world? This is a question that we are going to seek to answer through the Bible today. Why does God allow this to happen? You know, there's a term for this. They call it theodicy. Theo is where we get the word for God. Theodicy. The vindication of divine goodness and providence in view of the existence of evil. If God is so good, why is there evil in the world? Why is there evil? Why is Satan able to do the things that he does? Why is he able to rule the world the way he does? Why doesn't God do something about it? Why don't we see Jesus step in and just wipe it all away? Why doesn't he come soon? Big questions, huh? Today I want to invite you to the island of Patmos. On that island, something happened. The Roman Emperor Domitian exiled John the Revelator to the Isle of Patmos. John was in Rome, or he was in Ephesus, part of the Roman Empire. And they tried to kill John. Have you ever heard the story of how they tried to kill John? This is an incredible story. What they did is they had set up a boiling pot of oil. I've been to the spot where they believe this took place. They had a boiling pot of oil... And what they did is they were going to throw John into this boiling pot of oil. They'd set it up specially designed to silence this preacher. Might be somebody in here tempted to do such things. I don't know why you're laughing. Mercy, man. Here's what happened. I want you to imagine the scene. John is on the cusp of the end of his life. He's in his 90s, this aged apostle, the last of the apostles alive, the last of Jesus' initial disciples. And they're just about to push him in. I can imagine the thoughts going through the mind of John. I've served you all my life. I've served you all my life. Now I will serve you 
and my death. But what happened? They pushed John in, and John did not die. In fact, John began looking around and was like, I'm not dead. (laughs) I'm going to (laughs) preach. So he started preaching. And so they didn't know what to do with John. This is, if you ever get to go to Rome, this is the area where they believe that the boiling pot of oil was. In fact, there's now a small chapel. There's a church nearby. This is the chapel. And they, they even have depictions of John here. But it's in that place. They didn't know what to do with John. They couldn't kill him with boiling pot of oil. He began preaching. They couldn't silence him because it was, it was too hot for them to get into it. <laughs> so they exiled him. They put him on the Isle of Patmos. Patmos is a rocky island. It is only nine miles long. It's not that big. It's where they would send the people they could do nothing about, and John was something they could do nothing else about. They threw him there. If you go to the Isle of Patmos today, it's, it's a, they got a fledging town there. There's only two real ways to get to the Isle of Patmos. One is from Turkey. It's a long one. You, you go over, o- overnight, and if you're... If you're not used to the seas, <laughs> don't recommend that journey. The other one is from, is from Greece. Excuse me, Greece, if you, that one's overnight. Turkey is the short one. It's only a few hours. It's a few hours. Anyway, you arrive at the Isle of Patmos. On the Isle of Patmos, they have a chapel there. And inside of this chapel, they depict where they believe that John received his last message from Jesus. There, can you imagine John? John now exiled. John now all alone. John with no more friends around him. John wondering, why am I still alive? In the darkness of his life, Jesus spoke to John. When everything else seemed to be over with, Jesus still spoke to John. It is sometimes when we feel that God is so distant from us that He's ready to give us the greatest revelation of our lives. God wants to reveal something to you today. And so the Bible describes for us in in Revelation chapter 1. We go there. Please take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, the Bible describes that the angel came to John. An angel came to John. Here's what the Bible says. Whoops. Here's what the Bible says. (laughs) You're going to have to look it up. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Christ wanted to reveal himself to John in the midst of his loneliness. In the midst of his suffering. In the midst of his agony. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. I want you to notice the process of how God was revealing himself to John. God is in heaven. He gives the message to Jesus. Jesus takes that message, gives it to an angel. An angelic messenger leaves heaven, comes down to earth, and reveals his will to John. Isn't that incredible? This is literally a heaven-sent message. It's a message that I believe God wants us to understand. It's a message that He says is to go forward at the end of time. In the book of Revelation, there's an apex. What happens is every chapter preceding Revelation chapter 12 is leading up to Revelation chapter 12. Every chapter after Revelation 12 leads down to the end of time. So it goes from the time of John up to Revelation 12. Then in Revelation 12, we see a climax. What is happening in Revelation 12 that is so significant for us? We go there, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. That does not sound like heaven to me. It doesn't sound like heaven. The first war that the Bible ever talks about is in heaven. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon... And the dragon and his angels fought. And, but they did not prevail. Nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. The Bible describes for us that there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. 
There was now a civil war that took place in heaven. A battle for the throne. A battle for worship. Who is going to be worshipped? Satan and his angels fought, or the dragon and his angels fought. Dragon is Satan. And Michael and his angels fought with them. The Bible continues and tells us, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A war broke out in heaven. A Star Wars experience took place in heaven. There was a great controversy that took place. A conflict of the ages was happening. Who is to be worshipped? Satan was sowing the seeds of deception even in heaven. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And Satan was accusing God, saying, You are not fair. You are not just. You are not loving. You don't care about us. We have to serve you out of fear. Not out of love. And God was putting up with it. We don't know how long, but the Bible describes that this conflict took place and eventually Satan had to go. Satan had to go. The dragon and his angels had to be let go. Why in the world did God not destroy Satan when he knew he could have fallen? Why didn't he do it then? Why didn't he squash the problem when he had the chance? Why didn't he do it then? Those are the questions we seek to answer today. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28, this is what was happening. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Satan, when he was, when Satan was not created, Lucifer was created. When Lucifer was created, he was an angelic being. He was beautiful. He was a being of dazzling brightness, the Bible describes for us. In fact, it says that every precious stone was your covering. Does anyone know how many stones Lucifer had? He had ten stones. In fact, the Bible tells us the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. Ten stones. Do you know how many stones the high priest wears when he enters into the most holy place? He has twelve. Who is our high priest? He was two stones less than Jesus. That's how close he was to the throne of God. He was an anointed cherub the bible tells us he had a high and exalted position in heaven the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created he was created to be perfect he was pray created to give glory and praise to god but what happened what happened to lucifer what made him fall how is it that he went from one of the highest positions in the entire universe to being the devil and Satan. How is that possible? How is that possible? It continues, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. The Bible describes that Lucifer was an angelic being who was there in heaven and was walking in the very presence of God. His very presence. His very present. The Bible also tells us in another passage, he gave wisdom to Ezekiel and he also gives wisdom. Oh, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Somehow over the course of time, Lucifer began to look more at himself and less at God. He looked more at who he was. And somehow Lucifer began to focus on himself so much, he began thinking, I could do a better job than God. I could run a government better than God can. I could do this. In fact, I should do this. I should do this. Got so many stories running through my mind. <laughs> Members who want to take the place of the preacher. 
we won't go there. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's look at something inspired. Oh, this is whoops, Ezekiel 28. Your heart was filled up. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. The Bible tells us that something happened to Lucifer. What happened? How did he get so filled with pride? The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. The word for Lucifer is two words in the Latin that have been combined. It's lux faro. Simply means the light bearer, the light holder. It was Lucifer's job to take the light from God and to give it to the angels. Just like the angel who got the message, message came from God, gave it to Jesus. Jesus gives message to angel. Angel takes that message to John. That was his job. It was his role to give the light to others of who Jesus was. How you are fallen from heaven, O, o Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I, notice this, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. Do you know what the mount of the congregation is? Every Israelite knew what the mount of the congregation was. The mount of the congregation was the place where God came down on Mount Sinai and gave his law. From Egypt, it was north. From where they left, it was north on the furthest sides of the north. It's where God's law was. And God's law governed his, well, his, his government. It was the basis of his government. The foundation of God's law is love. How to love God and how to love men. That was the foundation of God's law, love. But Lucifer said, no, 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 no. That's not right. We, we're not serving you out of love. They began to sow the seeds of doubt and the image of God got marred. It got changed. They began to wonder, who is God? What is he really about? It continues, I will ascend on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the most, uh, above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer's end goal was to take the place of God. And for some, he's done that. Five times in Isaiah chapter 14, Lucifer says, I, 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 I. He had an eye problem. <laughs> Lucifer had a serious eye problem. My friends, the middle of sin is I. The middle of pride is I. I will do this. Lucifer wanted the position that was reserved only for God alone. I will be like the Most High. That can only go on for so long. There was now war in heaven. And Lucifer and his angels, he took one third of the angels with him. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 12. One third of them were cast out so did God create earth to be a dumping off place for Lucifer? It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. He was cast to the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. I don't think it was a dumping off place. When God created the earth, he created it beautiful. It was magnificent. The Bible says over and over and over, every day he completed his objective, he said, it is good. 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 It is very good. My friends, when God created the world, he created it good. There was nothing bad in the world. There was no taint of sin. There was nothing wrong with the world. In fact, God would come down personified in Jesus, and he would spend time with Adam and Eve. In the cool of the day, he would come down, the Bible describes for us. But one day, one day, it only took three chapters, the Bible describes for us, God wanted a door forever shut. Forever shut. The door of disobedience. 
You know the story well. Eve was there. She saw this tree, probably wondering, why can't I have that tree? What is God withholding from me? And Satan, hearing her thoughts spoken out loud. Have you ever, have you ever thought something and you're, you realize you're speaking out loud? Nobody, really. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just don't want to confess. Here's what happened. The Bible describes it for us. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Satan is suggesting the same thing today. Won't die? If you take a little bit of this, you're not going to die. It's not going to kill you. You'll be okay. Don't worry, only a little of it is going to be okay. <laughs> you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat, of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve wanted the same thing that Satan wanted, to ascend, to be like the Most High. The thing he used to attract her was to be like the Most High. Something happened though. God wanted this door forever shut, the door of disobedience. And Eve took part in this, in this sin. It might look small. <laughs> it might look small. And Satan is saying the same thing to us today. You can do whatever you want with your life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can be greater than the Most High. You can, you can be in charge of your life. You, you can control and dictate what you want to do. You can put and eat whatever you want. You can put as much as you want into your body. Do whatever you want. But we know what, the, what happens with sin. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 that, the, that sin separates us from God. And God being the source of life, if God is the source of life, He is, being separated from God now, they were to receive one punishment, death. The Bible tells us for the wages of sin is death. In fact, take your Bible, I'll show you this. Go to Genesis chapter 2. I don't think I put this in here. Genesis chapter 2. Somebody asked why I carry my Bible. This is why right here. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, when you're there, just say amen. Good, 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 good. You know, it's not too far. It's after chapter 1, okay? It's after chapter 1, Genesis, first book of the Bible. Don't worry, don't worry. We're, we're, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. The Bible tells us, verse 15, And God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The Bible is very clear. Jesus was very specific. There was no guesswork in the day. And I've asked the question. I have wondered to myself, why didn't Adam and Eve die that day? Yeah, you can go mm, try to skirt around that. Well, they began to die that. No, 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 no. In the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's no guesswork there. In the day you eat, you will die. It's like one equals two. And one plus one equals two. There's no guesswork. Why didn't Adam and Eve die that day? I've said this. Sometimes to understand Genesis, you have to look at Revelation. Sometimes to understand Revelation, you've got to look at Genesis. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. So we're going from the beginning to the end. We're moving very quickly. Beginning to the end, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. When you're there, just say amen. amen. The Bible tells us this is why they did not die that day. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb who what? Was slain when? From the foundation of the world. God had a plan he set in place. Just in case. Adam and Eve were to take part of that fruit. One day, looking forward into the future, his son would die. A lamb would be slain. And the Bible says that he was slain from the foundation, meaning that grace was given to Adam and Eve at the beginning. Incredible. God had grace at the beginning, not just at the end. <laughs> I just think that's cool. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the midst of their separation from God, in the midst of them knowing that they have sinned, guilty, wrong, had to plead it. 
God said, I'm going to step in. I'm going to do something about this. God said, I am going to place my own son there. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is saying the same thing to us. I will do something about it. You know, we ask the question, why does God allow suffering? This is not a new question. This is a question that the disciples posed to Jesus. Jesus, why do you allow suffering to continue? And Jesus responded. He gave them a parable about a sower who went forth to sow. The Bible tells us the story. It's in, it's in Matthew chapter 13. If you have your Bible, please turn Matthew chapter 13. So Jesus is speaking here in Matthew chapter 13. He puts forth a parable, verse 24. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. What kind of seed? Good seed. So he sows good seed in his field. And then they respond, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the man puts in good seed. And the people are looking at it after it's being ready to be harvested. Why are there tares in the good seed? Did you not make the world good? Did you not have good seed? Was something wrong with the water in Tucson? What was wrong? Why are there tares among the good seed? Here's what, here's what Jesus says. He says, So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Same question, right? Same question. How then does it have tares? Why are there tares among the good seed? Why is there suffering in our world? Why is there pain in our world? Why is there evil in our world? Why are there tares in the church? It's another question. We won't go there. Jesus responds. He says to them, a what has done this? An enemy has done this. An enemy was looking at the good of the world. An enemy was looking at the goodness of God. And he says, I've got to do something about this. They don't deserve this. They don't deserve this. I'm going to step in and I'm going to do something about it. Satan was restricted at that point to one tree. He was restricted. And so long as they weren't near that tree, so long as they didn't eat that fruit, so long as they didn't come around that thing, they would not hear the voice of that tempter speaking to them. They were okay. Sometimes we need to step away from Satan. We're going to have to work on that one. Some of you like Satan a little bit more than I do. Jesus says this. He says, he says, the enemy who sowed them is who? The devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Several years ago, I had a friend who began studying this topic. Maybe like you have. Didn't actually come to a series of meetings. Met somebody who he was working with. Mr. Shirky, would you come forward? My friends, welcome Chris Shirky. Chris Shirky is a friend of mine, usually. Ah, always. <laughs> I'm your friend. I don't know about the other <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shirky, please tell me, what were you doing? What was happening in your life? Well, I was living just like most people do. I was happy with my life. I was uh, starting out in business and thought I was doing everything that we were supposed to do. And then the Lord allowed some 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 badness to come into my life, some tragedy that came into my life. Not a, not a major tragedy, but something that, that got my attention and just shook me up. And I wondered, why is this happening? Why are these things, and I, and I, I was actually going through so much of a trauma that I was afraid to even share it with most of my friends because they, I thought that they thought I would probably be going insane or I would have been drinking too much or whatever. And I ran into a friend that I didn't even know was a Seventh-day Adventist. And one day I finally just broke down and I shared it with him. And he told me, he said, no, I, I, I know you're, I know, I believe you. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. What was happening? Well, <laughs> I was being harassed by demons. I had shown an interest. I wasn't into, into spiritualness as far as the, the devil or anything. I really was 
probably pretty much of an agnostic. I knew I was created, and I was, there was a God, but I didn't know, you know, how he dealt with the day-to-day uh, living. But I showed an interest in a friend who was getting involved in some spiritualism, and just by showing an interest, these demons started harassing me. Tremendously. I mean, to the point where I almost um, was in a situation a few times where I just wanted to jump out a second-story window just to get away. And I knew, I didn't know at the time, but I know now that Satan was just trying to destroy me. But this gentleman, when I shared it with him, he said, I do believe you. And then he opened revelation to me, and he showed me how there was war in heaven. And I thought, how could there be war in heaven? It's a perfect place. Well, it was a war of words. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And it was just the devil going behind and backbiting the Lord and people listening. You know, it's kind of like what we do today when we think, if we hear something on the news and we believe it without even knowing if it's true or not. We, We trust people that seem to be in the know. And Satan did that. So there was war in heaven, and then the the angels, the third of the angels, and he were cast to earth. And now I was starting to see that there really is a reason for life, that there really are reasons for the way things happen in the the world. And, you know, there's a big thing now where we want to uh, honor and respect those who go to war for America and serve their country, and I think that's a great thing. But the first thing I could think of is, we're all in a war in this world. And we have to decide who we want to be aligned with. And so I started taking Bible studies, learning more about God. And the more I learned about him, the more I fell in love with him. Thank you, Mr. Sharkey. I really appreciate that. Everyone else want to say thank you? Thank you, Mr. Sharkey. My friends, there is an answer to the question, why is there suffering? Why is there evil in our world? The reason is, an enemy has done this. He has sowed tares among the wheat. He has put himself, his desire, to be in the place of God. Why doesn't God do something about it then? Why didn't he wipe out Satan when he had the chance? Why did he create Satan with the ability to choose to do wrong? How many of you are married? Okay, some of you are going to have to work on that. We're going to, if you need counseling, I know somebody. (laughs) We're going to have to work on that a little bit. Some of you don't want to admit you're married. Yep, we're going to really have to work on that one. If you don't sleep in your home tonight, I can't help you. (laughs) That's between you and your home. How many of you have children? Anyone? Oh, now you admit it. Okay, okay. I see how it is. You like your children more than you like your husband or your wife. Ah, ah, ah. Truth is out. This is why you guys don't want to do the poll question. Don't forget the poll. I'm sure there are times that your husband, your wife, your child does things that you just don't like. I I don't want any confessions, okay? This is not the time or the place. (laughs) But I'm sure they do things that you wonder, if only I wasn't a Christian. (laughs) No? This side seems to know what I'm talking about. This side's wondering where I'm going. Do Do you wish at times that there was a screw in the back of the head of your husband, your wife, your child. Calm down there. Calm down, sister. (laughs) Calm down. (laughs) Maybe it's a parent. (laughs) Where you could just turn that screw and the the robot (laughs) husband, wife, or child now says, I love you and I will do everything you want me or need me to do. I will make my bed. I will cook for you. I'm getting some people in trouble. (laughs) I will do everything you want me to do. Whatever you ask, I will do. Any of you want that? What? (laughs) I'm shocked. 
That's not what you were sounding like a few seconds ago. <laughs> you were like, yes, yes, yes. Now I say what it is. No, no, no. <laughs> Why not? My friends, if we take away the power to choose, then it's not really love. It's not really love. And if, if, if we only serve God because we are made, we are obligated, we have to, we have no choice in the matter, then we're not really serving God out of love. We're serving Him out of obligation. And that's not what God wants. God created the devil. as He didn't create the devil. God created Lucifer. He created Lucifer perfect, sinless. But He created him with one important aspect. To be able to choose to love God. He gave him the ability to choose. And if you take away that choice, you take away the power to love. And if you take away the power to love, you take away the power to be truly happy. And God wanted people. He wanted his angels. He wanted every creature he ever created to be truly happy. So God, when he created Adam and Eve, he created them with the ability to choose. Do you want to be happy? We still have that choice today. So why didn't God do something? Why didn't He do something there in the Garden of Eden? Why didn't He squash the devil then? My friends, I want to show you the first prophecy in Scripture. We've been studying prophecy. Please turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. This is the first prophecy in Scripture. Jesus says He's going to do something. We've looked at Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Now we're in Genesis 3. Three is after two, and it's before four. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible tells us very clearly God did something about it. He says, I will put enmity, verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I'm going to put a separation. I'm going to put, I'm going to put a great barrier in between you and, your woman, and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Bible tells us that one day, Jesus was going to come. Jesus was going to come, and Satan was going to try to bruise Jesus. I'm going to bruise your heel. But he said, Jesus said, I'm going to bruise your head. And if you take out a serpent's head, get him out. I'm going to do something about it. I did something about it. I made you a promise, and I cannot lie, God says. I can't lie. So what I say, it's going to happen. It might take a little while. The ultimate thing is, God is a God of love. And His whole thing is, He needs to make sure that we love Him out of love. Not out of obligation. Not out of, I have to. Not out of, well, I don't know. God needs to give us the ability the power to choose and to know that God is love. So down through the ages, He allowed things to happen. He allowed it to go on. Why didn't God squash Satan when He had the chance? Just wipe them all out. Let me give you a situation. Imagine this with me. Don't imagine too hard. Imagine this with me. Put that verse up there. Imagine this with me. A, a politician begins to disagree with the president. Now, that would never happen in our current presidency. <laughs> I didn't say who the president was. This is going to be recorded, and somewhere somebody's going to see something. But this would never happen, right? <laughs> never happen. Imagine the pre this, this politician begins to say some things, saying, no, 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 you shouldn't be the leader. I'm going to, I'm going to go and tell people how bad of a leader you are. We're going to do something about this. But then the president finds out about this and he sends out the militia. And he wipes out that leader, that politician, and everyone that he is associated with. <laughs> what would you think of that leader? Could the politician have been right? Could he? Could he? Could the president really be that bad? The question would remain there 
for eternity. And they would begin to wonder, they would begin to wonder, can God really be trusted? Are we serving God out of fear? They would serve him out of fear. They would have served that president out of fear. If we don't follow what he says, he's going to kill us. He's going to wipe us out. The reason that God did not wipe out Satan is he had to show the world that he was truly a God of love. So how could he do that? How could he show the world that he was a God of love? He sent, he said that one day I am going to send my son. My friend, one day Jesus was born in a place in Bethlehem. He was born of a virgin, the Bible describes for us. He was raised as a young child, grew up in this home. Jesus had to then live the life that Adam should have lived. Adam sinned. Jesus was sinless. They met at a tree. Jesus would one day die on a tree. Jesus, the Bible tells us, would be tempted like you and I. He would be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible describes that Satan himself appeared to Jesus and would try to tempt him to follow his way. If you will do this, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die for these people. They don't really love you anyway. But Jesus would ultimately die on the cross. It is at the cross that the question of why does God allow suffering finds its answer. Every question in the Bible finds its answer at the cross. The cross explains to us that God truly loves us. And so when we ask God, how much do you, you love me? He says, I love you this much. I love you this much. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, I, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. He wants to draw us with his love. He has demonstrated that he is willing to die for us. What greater love has any man than this? than to lay down his life for his brother. My friends, Jesus died for us. That's what he did. Jesus didn't stand by silent, waiting for life to just go on and us to be wiped out into oblivion. Jesus said, I am going to step into their time. I'm going to step into their place. I am going to be the person they should have been. I am going to do something about it. He came. But Jesus is also still doing something about it. Why did not Jesus do something in the suffering that we experience in life today? My friends, he is doing something. If you go to the tomb in Jerusalem, Jesus isn't there. The Bible tells us that Jesus ascended into heaven. The Bible tells us that Jesus was not kept in that tomb. He is doing something now. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, For we do not have an high priest, who could not sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands your pain. You feel the pain of separation? The pain of spiritual separation from God? My friends, Jesus felt it too. He cried out, God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you leaving me this way? If, if you can take this cup, then do so, Lord. Take it. Do you feel the pain of rejection? Jesus was rejected by his disciples. I don't know that man. Who is he? I don't even talk like him. My friends, Jesus understands your emotional pain. He understands your physical pain. He understands what it's like to have nails driven through his hands and his feet. He understands physical pain. He understands spiritual pain. Jesus understands what you are going through. We have a high priest. He understands. He was tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the Bible then tells us, let us therefore come boldly, in other words, confidently, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Bible tells us that Jesus is doing something now. Jesus is in heaven. And there before the throne of the universe, he is pleading in our behalf. Every time you pray, Jesus listens. Every time you pray, Jesus answers. 
Jesus is still doing something now. He understands your difficulty. He understands your trial. You want, you want to know, Jesus knows what it's like to be poor. He had nowhere to lay his head, the Bible tells us. He knows what it's like going through financial difficulty. Jesus understands. Jesus understands what we go through in life. He knows what we experience. And he is calling us. He is calling each one of us to know that he loves us. He loves us so deeply. He loves us so very, very much. Why didn't, do, why didn't God do something? He did. He promised his son. Why didn't God do something? There on the cross, he did. He died for you and me. Why doesn't Christ do something now? He does. He is there pleading in our behalf. There before the throne of God, saying, these are my children. These are the ones who I died for. These are the ones I love. These are the ones I love. And my friends, Christ will yet do something more. His work is not done. The Bible describes it for us. It tells us, Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. One day from now until the second coming, Christ says he will hold us up if we allow him to. Christ is coming soon. And on that day, something incredible is going to happen. In fact, you're not going to be able to miss it. If you're dead, you'll be resurrected. If you're alive, you'll see it. You'll be there. You'll hear it. You'll be around. Everyone will be around. It's going to be incredible. But on that day, something incredible is going to happen. Christ himself will come from heaven. We will meet him in the clouds one day soon. One day soon, there will be no more sickness. One day soon, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. One day soon, there will be no more death. My friends, one day soon, Christ is coming. And on, when Christ comes, something is going to happen. He said, he's promised us, evil will not rise up, affliction will not rise up a second time. He tells us that something is going to happen. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Christ is going to do something about the devil. The devil is going to be, the Bible continues, it says in Ezekiel 28, that same chapter where we were looking earlier, therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. One day soon, Christ is coming back. And on that day, Christ is telling us, he will be wiped out. There will be no more devil. There will be no more tempter. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more pain. Jesus is asking us something special today. Do you want to accept my love? Can you not see how much I love you? Can you not see what I have done for you? I am calling you, my friends, to recognize my love. Just now I'm inviting my friends to come forward. They're going to sing a special song. My friends, God loves us so very, very much. What more can I have done? You know, in the book of Isaiah, Jesus is looking at his vineyard. And as he's looking at his vineyard, he sees some things there. And he asks a question. What more could I have done that I have not done? What more could I have done that I have not done? The love of God, my friends. Excuse me. Oh, love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star. to the lowest hell the guilty pair bow down with care God gave his son to
it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song when years of time shall pass away thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so strong shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace to Adam's race the saints and skies of parchment made where every star on earth a quail and every man a scribe by trade to write the lie scroll contain the whole those stretched from sky to sky O love of God how rich and pure how measureless Jesus is calling out to us today. He is asking, will you accept my love? What more could I have done that I have not done for my beloved? Do you want to accept Jesus' love today? Do you want to say today, Lord, I want you to reign in my life. I want you to reign in my life. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, I thank you so very much for the love of Jesus, the love of God. Lord, I pray in a special way that we will experience that love today in Jesus' name.